just give it a moment for people to pop in. Okay, maybe we'll go ahead and get started. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Welcome everybody to the 1219th meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington. One note, as we're getting started here, the, uh, the meeting will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. If, you're one, if you want to visit our YouTube channel, I've posted a link in, in the chat. Um, but if you want to remain completely in, anonymous, um, just don't share your video. Um, and even though your name is showing, as you're seeing it now, when the video is recorded and posted, your name will not show, so you'll be totally anonymous. Um, do we have Gary Hevel on the line? Gary is our recording. Yes. Hello, Gary. Yes, I do. I am by telephone. My Comcast is down. I can't believe it. It started at 630 and it's in and out. So I'm uh, in by phone. Okay. Great. Well, uh, are are you able to to read the minutes from from last Ye meeting? Yes. Yes, I okay. certainly am. I have them before me. Okay. Great. The 1218th regular meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington convened at 7 p.m. on the 4th of February, 2021, via Zoom. Over 70 people tuned into the meeting. Due to the time zone differences, business items followed the presentation. Program Chair Alan Norbaum introduced the speaker of the evening, Daniel Rubinoff from the University of Hawaii. Dr. Rubinoff presented a brief introduction to the fancy case caterpillars, Hypos mocoma cosmopterigidae, Hawaii's most diverse radiation. With the use of images, the talk was an intriguing and inspirational view of the ongoing research being done by Dr. Rubinoff and colleagues. After the presentation, Recording Secretary Gary Hevel read the minutes from the January meeting. These were approved by the visual audience. Membership and Communications Secretary Elizabeth Young announced one new applicant for membership, that being Alejandra Estrada. The upcoming activities of the Young Entomology Group. President-elect Lourdes Chamorro noted that the annual banquet this year may be held in September rather than June. The meeting was adjourned at 8.45 p.m. Okay, thank you, Gary. Sure. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the minutes as read? Or, or well, first, do we do we have any amendments or suggested changes to the minutes? Uh, okay. If there are none, do we have a motion to approve the minutes as read? So moved. We have a movement to approve the, uh, the minutes. Se I hear a second. The minutes are approved. Thank you. Um, the next section will be reports of officers and committees. Do any of our officers have any anything they'd like to report this month? Okay, sounds like we don't have anything special to report. Uh, Jamie, next the only thing I had was the, you know, the the slide for the next meeting, but. Right, and I think we'll do that um, in an in upcoming session. So, okay. In section, so I'll let you know. Okay. Okay, so now we'll move on to introduction of new members or and visitors. So Elizabeth Young, are you on today? I am, hello there. Hey, Elizabeth. Hi, uh, we have two new members this month. Uh, okay. We've got uh, Bradley Sinclair from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And we also have Maria 
Julia Martin Silva, Silva from the University of Brazil. Excellent, thank you, welcome. And if we have any visitors um, that are not members that would like to introduce themselves, you're welcome to. You don't have to. Hi, I'm Dave Webb. Uh, I'm with the Maryland Biodiversity Project. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bree, and I will be joining to become a member next month. I'm very excited. Welcome, Bree. Welcome, Thank Dave. You. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So it sounds like a good time to actually mention um, that I've posted a link on the right uh, in the chat um, to our member page. Um, so if you would like to become a new member or would like to renew your membership, please go to that, that page and there's a, a new uh, Google form, a link to the Google form that you can fill out and become a member. It's a pretty good deal in my humble opinion. Um, a regular membership is $30 per year. Uh, student membership is just $15 per year. And with those uh, membership dues, you get access to the uh, online access to the Proceedings of the Entomological Society of Washington, which is published four times a year. You also get free page charges for publication in the, in the proceedings. And that includes for each publication that you might submit, um, it would include up to two free color plates. And also there's an, an option to um, subscribe for $60 a year and you get hard copies of the, of the proceedings too. James, I don't see a link. Maybe I'm the only one, but I can see it. In the chat at the top? In the chat at the top. I don't see anything. Okay. Huh. Does does anybody see it? First, first I've got a link to the YouTube channel, and then uh, below that, uh, a little note that says become a member. Nobody's seeing that? I'll try to post it again. And that posted, sorry. Yeah, great. Okay, how about now? Yeah. Okay, great. We're still getting used to this new technology. Um, thanks for your patience. Um, so, okay, that's members, um, unfinished business, and basically, I've taken care of all, all the all that. Um, on to new business. Uh, unfortunately, uh, um, a couple members of our community have, have passed away in the past month, and so we just want to acknowledge them, and so I'm going to share my screen. So uh, David Reuter was a member of our society. Uh, David uh, passed away on February 4th. Uh, Dave's career was spent in the assessment of impacts of water, uh, impacts on water and water resources. As part of his study on the impacts of projects and, and activities by the federal government on aquatic insects, he became fascinated by caddisflies, order Trichoptera, and began a journey that continued the rest of his life. He loved learning about these critters and sharing information with others. He considered himself to be a gentleman trichopterist and, and was well published and respected in the international caddis fly community. So our condolences to uh, Dave's family and friends and we'll miss him. And Al Norbaum will give a remembrance of Chris Thompson. Okay, thanks, Jamie. Oh, wait a minute. I uh, I did something to my screen here. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Yeah, we received sad news early last month that uh, Chris Thompson, a long-term member and former president and treasurer of ESW, uh, unfortunately passed away. I was telling Jamie this morning that we could spend the whole meeting talking about Chris's accomplishments and his impact on the systematic entomology lab, the Smithsonian, and on entomology more broadly. Um, you can see some of this listed on this slide. Um, Chris was a real force of nature. He was always full of new ideas and, and innovation. He liked to be involved in everything as indicated by his, contribu uh, his contributions to many entomological societies. He made major contributions to flower fly systematics and he was a leader in the Dipteric community. The fly names database that he almost single-handedly created is a vital resource for all of us. Uh, Chris was a mentor. He was happy to provide advice to students and colleagues, whether on systematics or nomenclature on which he was a noted expert. He and his wife, Betty, also generously supported the Smithsonian Libraries, the, Bio Heritage, excuse me, the Biodiversity Heritage Library, and the Williston Dipter Fund, among many other things. Um, the the Williston Fund regularly provided grants um, for students to attend meetings or to visit the US and M. Uh, so Chris had a, a huge impact on, on many of us and we will certainly miss him. Thanks Al. Again, our, our condolences to, to friends and family of Chris and, and, and today and Dave's friends and family as well. Um, <clears throat> we'll miss you. Okay, so before we get on to the, uh, the main talk for tonight, Al will also um, give an introduction to next week's, the talk for next, next month's meeting. Yeah, I don't think an uh, introduction is really needed, but um, just wanted to let you know what our, what our topic will be next month. As the, uh, the big brood is coming, uh, we're all going to be deluged with uh, questions from friends and, and neighbors, I'm sure. So. Um, please attend and you'll, you'll, you'll learn all the answers to tell them all. Okay. Thanks, Al. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. And again, I'll turn it over to Al to introduce tonight's speakers. Okay. I have the, uh, uh, I don't know, Andrew, if you want to start sharing your screen, perhaps. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Andrew Forbes. He's an evolutionary biologist and associate professor of biology at the University of Iowa. Uh, he grew up in London until the age of 10 and then in Philadelphia. He's uh, completed his undergrad at Colgate University, um, his PhD at the University of Notre Dame, and then did a postdoc at UC Davis. And uh, he will be co-presenting with Elaine Hippie, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Iowa. She's a native of Iowa and did her undergraduate and graduate uh, degrees also from the University of Iowa. And she was the recipient, recent recipient of the University of Iowa's Graduate Student Teaching Award, which is the highest such award for grad students at the University of Iowa. And today they're going to uh, tell us about a really interesting group of, of tefritid flies. It's the genus Strausia. Okay, uh, thanks so much, uh, Alan. And uh, thanks for everyone for attending. We're really excited to be a part of this. Uh, we're gonna tag team today. So I'm gonna sort of introduce the system and talk a little bit about some of the initial work that we've done. And then Elaine's gonna take over and, and uh, take us home. Oh, Andrew, uh, Andrew, excuse me one second. I, I forgot to mention, um, if anybody has uh, questions at the end, um, can you please just type them into the chat rather than um, just speaking up? So um, excuse me, Andrew, please go ahead. That, that's, that's fine. And in fact, uh, I'm comfortable enough in this format now that if anyone has questions during the talk, feel free to type them in and I'll, I'll note them and, and try to answer them as we go. So feel free to interject in that way as well. Okay. Um, Great, so uh, I guess we'll get started here. <clears throat> we, we'd like to actually just start, uh, I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but uh, we wanna start by acknowledging that we're coming to you from the homelands of many tribal nations 
And we just want to acknowledge the sovereignty uh, and the traditional territories of these tribal nations and uh, the treaties that were uh, used to remove those people from these lands such that you know, now we occupy that land uh, with the University of Iowa. So um, if you want to learn more about why it's important to acknowledge land, there's a bunch of resources on the internet you can find uh, to uh, read about. Okay, so um, we'd like to, I'm going to actually start out with our introduction here, not talking about insects and pretty much talking about every other kind of living thing, but we will eventually get to uh, the insects and Cystrausia in particular. I want to start by uh, telling you a little bit about Sarah Martha Baker, who uh, many of you may not know about. She was a young naturalist at the turn of the last century, and she was really interested in organisms that live in the intertidal zone. And in particular, she noticed that there were different species of seaweed that lived in the high tide zone versus uh, the lower intertidal zone. Like any good scientist, she had a hypothesis about why that might be. And specifically, she thought, well, maybe those species that grow at the higher intertidal zone are better able to uh, deal with desiccation with longer periods of being out of the water. And so she designed an experiment to test this. She took her different species of seaweed and subjected them to different uh, times of uh, desiccation. And she found that indeed some species had a higher tolerance for desiccation. Now, her, she, as you can see, she died pretty young. And so her work went largely unnoticed and other people did very similar experiments and to great acclaim and became very well known for this work. But she was sort of the pioneer in this area. And Baker's work and the work of many other early ecologists have led to a much more familiar idea uh, which is known as the ecological niche concept. And, and this, you know, many of you may know about this already, but we're gonna just sort of explain it to get everyone on the same page. This is the idea that any given organism uh, can be de uh, defined in, in various ways by all of its overlapping environmental constraints. And so this is just a figure from a textbook, but I, I really like it. Here, if you're imagining, I, I think in this case, it's supposed to be a deer, a species of deer, you could, you could break down all of the different dimensions of how that deer interacts with its environment and think about its tolerances for certain things. So for instance, its tolerance for food size. It can't eat things that are, are very much too big for it and it maybe doesn't eat things that are very small. And so there's a range of tolerance for food size for the deer. <clears throat> Similarly, you could add uh, another dimension, foraging height. And then the third, maybe it has some tolerance for a range of humidities. And this could go on uh, by adding many more dimensions of, of limits and tolerance for the species until you have a multi-dimensional niche. And this then is the sort of one way to think about the niche for this species. Now, this is again, a fundamental idea in ecology, but it informs lots of other uh, things that, uh, ecological ideas. For instance, it tells us something about what we might expect when you have two species co-occurring with uh, broadly overlapping niches. In, in other words, sort of the same set of, uh, of, of dimensions of tolerance. So here's another really classic experiment, this one involving diatoms, and sorry, no insects yet. Uh, in this case, we're looking at the growth of two species of diatoms, which use silica to create their, I don't know if you call them skeletons, but these really Baroque um, shells that they make. Uh, and if you grow them alone, they utilize the silica and they grow just fine. These are pretty classic um, growth curves. It looks like they hit a carrying capacity. But if you put these species of diatom together, they're competing, they, they largely overlap in their niche. And inevitably what happens is one competitively excludes the other. And so this is the, this again emerges from this idea of the ecological niche that if there's too much overlap. The expectation is you shouldn't be able to uh, coexist. <clears throat> uh, and so yes, we have this expectation that if we have closely related species that, that uh, coexist in, ex in the, exactly the same niche, we don't expect them to uh, be able to do that, to coexist. But 
when we do observe this in nature, it can be exciting because we can then ask why and how they are able to coexist in the same niche, or at least in what's apparently the same niche. So one more classic experiment outside of insects, Robert MacArthur, the uh, famous ecologist, had this observation that many different species of warbler apparently were using the same uh, conifers and apparently eating the same things and doing the same things in those conifers. But when he stops and looks at where they're spending their time and what they're actually eating, it looks like different, uh, what he discovers is that different species of warbler are actually dividing up those resources, dividing up the niche much more finely than he had previously thought. And so this is the case of someone discovering why in many, or in these cases, we have more biological diversity in a system than we might otherwise predict. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about insects. So most insects, um, hopefully most of you agree with, with, with us on this, most insects are at least broadly speaking, specialist parasites. They use in some way during the course of their life uh, an, an animal or a plant or some other thing as their host. <clears throat> we also know that when we start to look at the evolutionary histories of many specialist insect genera or families of specialist insects, we, we note that they are defined by histories of changes in their host use, oftentimes correlated with what look like the moments of their speciation. Not necessarily implying cause and effect here, but we do see that when there's a speciation event that typically is associated with a change in host or a change in habitat. So this is a phylogeny, which you don't really need to look at all that closely, but it's, it's one from another one of the graduate students in our lab here. And this is a phylogeny of uh, inquiline wasps that are associated with uh, gall making wasps and oaks. And we have a bunch of different species here and most, in most cases, they're pretty specialized on just one or a few galls. Uh, and largely, they don't co-occur with other, uh, other inquiline wasps in the same genus. But in a couple of cases, they do. So if you look here, we've got uh, four different uh, species that are co-occurring in Philonix galls. And so Here's a case where we observe host sharing, apparent overlap in the same niche. And it's exciting to us because it gives us an opportunity to ask why this is and how it is that they can occupy the same, or at least apparently the same host niche. <clears throat> Here's another example. Uh, and I was really excited to see Marty log into this call. So I wanna tell you just a little bit about the blepharneuro system that Marty Condon's been working on for many, many years and that I and a few other people in, in, in my lab have been uh, lucky enough to participate in some of this work. So um, blepharneuro is a genus of tephritid flies found in Central and South America. And Marty over the years has found through both morphological and genetic uh, methods that there are more than 60 species of Blepharneuro fly. And as is the case for many insects, each species is more or less host specific to a single plant species. And it's, it's more than that actually, it's uh, they're host specific often to a single flower sex. So they attack plants that have dioecious, that are dioecious, so they have male and female flowers. And typically the flies only they lay their eggs into either the male flower or the female flower. What's even cooler and, and uh, connects to the rest of this talk so far is that oftentimes multiple species of Blepharneura will lay their eggs into the same sex flower of the same species of plant. So there's this really amazing overlap or at least apparent overlap in the same flower niche. And so one of the questions Marty has had for many years is uh, how is this possible? Why, why do we see this hyper diverse um, system? So I'm, I'm just gonna, this deserves its own full talk, of course. And uh, you know maybe Marty can come to this group and, and tell you more about the system. Uh, but uh, I'll just say one of the reasons that we think that uh, we have multiple flies occurring in the same flowers 
So if you imagine this kind of cartoon scenario here where we have four different species of fly using the same flowers of the same plant, what we've learned is that each species of fly has its own specialist braconid parasitoid that's trying to lay its eggs into that fly. And if it does, it can kill that fly. So it's very good at killing one species. In this case, imagine species B is very good at killing species two. It's a specialist parasite of that, of that fly. But what Marty and, uh, and, a, and a few of us in collaboration with Marty have been able to discover is that if species B lays its eggs into the wrong fly, the fly, the other fly's immune system can kill those eggs. And so what you essentially have here is a system where uh, your neighbors can kill your predators. And so it's actually really good for each of these flies to have the other species in, uh, in the same flowers because they potentially can increase your fitness. So this is, this is an example of some of the really cool biology that can emerge from these systems where you have a, a more diversity than you would expect. <clears throat> so for the rest of this talk, we're gonna focus on the system we've been working on and uh, we, we've sort of picked it up for a variety of different reasons, but one has to do with this idea of co-occurring in the same host plant. So the focus today will be on these Straussia flies. These are also tephridids like Blepharonura. And for the most part, at least this is something that we've learned and, and largely confirmed at this point, they, for the most part, they specialize on just a single host plant species. A little bit about their biology. So, um, there, there's 13 or 14 species or named species found across central and eastern United States and Canada. The one that we've largely focused on has been uh, Straussia longipennis, at least what at that point we were calling Straussia longipennis. And specifically the flies in Straussia longipennis that are associated with Jerusalem artichoke, Helianthus tuberosus. A little bit about their biology. The male flies, uh, in searching for mates, they actually stake out territories on leaves. So they hang out on a leaf and then the female fly looking for mates lands on the leaf where, where a male is and they mate. And then the female fly lays her eggs into the, uh, the apical meristem, so the growing tip of the plant. Usually it wouldn't have the flower on it at that point. The eggs hatch. The larvae then feed on the pith, so the, um, the tissue at the center of the stem of the plant and they make their way down the stem and then they pupate either in the root crown or in some cases they exit the plant and they pupate in the soil around the plant. So they're very specialized on that plant host and basically their whole life cycle. What's really cool, and, and again, one of the reasons why we started working on this system is that there was some evidence that more than one species of fly were actually using the same Jerusalem artichoke host. <clears throat> so that's why we picked it up. Um, when I say it's not totally clear how many species were using the uh, Jerusalem artichoke, this is actually a common problem within Straussia. There's a lot of uh, taxonomic confusion over the years about who's a species and who isn't. Originally, there was just one species described, and then there were uh, additional species names suggested. Some of them got synonymized, and you know some of it's worked out, but at the point where we started working on this, there was still a lot of taxonomic confusion. <clears throat> so what's this prior evidence that we had that Longipennis might actually be uh, more than one species? One is morphological. So if you collect a bunch of flies, oh, and I should say, all of this work was done also by Marty Condon at Cornell College and some of her undergraduates that were working with her at the time, led by Heather Axon, who went on to become a, a professor as well. So, okay. One of the things we find is if you collect a bunch of flies off of tuberosis, you see morphological differences. One of them is there's variation in the patterns that these flies have on their dorsal thorax. So there's two kind of extreme versions of this. There's what we call the typica morphology, where they really don't have very much on their thorax, maybe a couple of little dots at the bottom. And then what we call a vertigera uh, morphology, where you have these darker, stripes running down the edges of their thorax. There's also variation in the wings, which is a little bit trickier and, and maybe even more interesting. 
there's there's quite a bit of variation um but in general you see flies that have distinct lines on their wings and we'll call those various things an f pattern is the label here we also saw see some patterns that we call a, a posterior pattern but those again have these well-defined lines on the wings uh, we see this pattern the f pattern or something like it in all females and some males and then in some of the males the rest of the males we see what's called a coalesce pattern where it looks like you've taken those lines and squished them together. So it's a bit darker and less well-defined as, as individual uh, marks on the wing. <clears throat> the other piece of evidence we had that came from uh, Marty's group is, is genetic. Um, and I should say, we've done a lot of genetic work in this group, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about the genetic markers or uh, genetic analyses that we've done, but we certainly could talk about that uh, in the questions and answers if you'd like. I will say that Marty's group sequenced um, a little bit of the mitochondrial genome, the mitochondrial cytochrome oxidase 1 gene, uh, the barcoding gene for animals. And they did that for the flies they collected on tuberosis, but also some flies from a different species, Strausia perfecta. And then they put this little network together showing where those flies ended up, where uh, sort of clustering together the, the uh, sequences from those flies. And what they found, which was interesting, was that the tuberosis flies formed these two clusters. They weren't perfectly associated with any of these morphologies. There were maybe some, some clues that there were some association with morphologies, but at the very least, it was suggesting that there might be some, at least maybe two, maybe more species uh, on tuberosis. So that was, that was really cool and really exciting. As I said, we've done, after we picked that up, we interrogated these flies with a variety of different molecular markers, including, um, we I think we started with mitochondrial, then went to AFLPs, and then uh, um, microsatellites. And it's actually microsatellite data that you see here. Again, I'm not gonna go into great detail with the methods. All you really need to know here is that we took these genetic markers, and then we used them to infer how many reproductively isolated clusters there were among the flies on tuberosis, and then to assign each fly into one of those clusters. And what you see here, which was super exciting at the time for us, and uh, uh, well, is that it looks like we have three reproductively isolated clusters indicated by flies in the blue group, the green group, and the red group. And at least in the males, there was a real association with morphological characters and these genetic groups. The blue group here are the flies with no stripes on their thorax and uh, the, the F, F wings. In the green here, we have vitigerous uh, thorax flies with the coalesced wings. And then we have this third combination uh, in the red group. We didn't at the time call these different species, but as you'll see in a moment, these represent three different species that coexist on the tuberosis host. And in fact, we can actually talk, say a little bit more about their morphology now. So here are the males. The females, uh, the long, uh, this, this group down here also don't have the stripes. So the thorax is, is consistent uh, within species. Um, two of the uh, species females are pretty hard to tell apart because they do still have these stripes and the uh, non-coalesced wings. And we also now can put names on these. these at least closely resemble flies that had been described morphologically in the past and given names and then variously synonymized. But at this point, we're ready to call them Strausia vitigera, Strausia longitudinalis, and Strausia longipennis. So that's cool. We have three species on the same host plant. And our next question then was, well, we have three species on the same host plant. How did they all get there? How did they come to coexist on the same host plant? And we decided then to take a, with this to take a phylogenetic approach and essentially to evaluate two primary hypotheses for how they came to coexist. And there could be others, of course, but these are the two we were sort of most, most interested in and seem most likely. The first is that <clears throat> the ancestral fly to all of these species was on Jerusalem artichoke. And there may have been periods in the past, perhaps during uh, periods of glaciation 
where the flies and their host plants became isolated from one another. And during those periods, maybe the flies became reproductively isolated, such that when they came back together, um, they now were two species of fly or two reproductively isolated flies on the same host plant. If that were the case, we might have a phylogenetic prediction. And that would be that those flies on the same host plant would be at least reasonably uh, closely related to one another, as indicated here. An alternative though, is that they came to coexist on tuberosis via shifting from other host plants, maybe other sunflowers or other asteraceous plants. So in this case, you have a fly on another sunflower and they come into contact and that fly shifts onto tuberosis and then diverges from its ancestral fly. And now you have two species of fly on tuberosis. And in this case, you would have a different prediction. If you were to get a phylogeny, you would expect those flies on tuberosis indicated by the stars here to not be as closely related as you would in, in the previous hypothesis. Okay, so our goal here then is to generate the first phylogeny for Straussia to evaluate these competing hypotheses and also to give us tools to work in the system more broadly. And so um, we took a, uh, a reduced representation genome sequencing approach here. We generated RADseq markers. Um, we also, we did this also because we have plans in the future to do some population genomic work. And so we want these markers to be useful uh, for both of these things. We collected all of the known Straussia species in North America, and I guess that means also in the world. Um, I have minus one here because there is one species that was named from a damaged specimen and has never been seen since, and we don't know anything more about it, and I don't believe it exists, but uh, okay, we didn't collect and use sequence that one. Altogether, we had 129 flies. Um, this is, I think, most of the distribution of those flies. We also did have some from Arizona, though, that aren't on this map. And then we use these, uh, these variable sites that we get from our RADseq approach to infer phylogeny. Again, I'm not gonna go into great detail with the methods here. So here's the phylogeny. Uh, the nice thing about presenting like this <clears throat> is that uh, I can move, move around. Can everyone see the phylogeny? Al, I can see, Alan, I can see you. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see it? Can you see this tree? This thumbs up. Uh, we can we can see the tree, not Thank details, you. but the tree. No, that, yes. no, that's great. That's but that what I can do. So here's the here's the zoomed out version of the tree, and what I want to do now is zoom in on it. And what I'm just going to show you is we still can't see it in any great detail. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but what we're able to do with this tree is resolve these uh, clades here that represent all of our known and previously named species. So for instance, here is Strausia perfecta at the bottom. This is a fly associated with giant ragweed. Um, and as we scroll up here, we start to see some of our species that are associated with tuberosis. So here's the first one, Strausia longitudinalis. Another one, Noctipennis, which is on uh, Helianthus grossus serratus, Strausia rugosum. Here's our second fly that's associated with tuberosis, Strausia longipennis. Interestingly, and maybe a story for another day, these flies are also on Helianthus annuus. So, and what's cool about that is both of these plants were domesticated by native North Americans six to 10,000 years ago. And we think there's maybe something to that. Drowsia longipennis' uh, closest relative is a fly that we're calling Bush's fly. It was described uh, in a master's thesis by Ed Lazowski, who I think is also on this Zoom call today, and we've never spoken to one another. Hi, hi Ed. Um, uh, I guess that, that means it, the name doesn't really count, apparently, but uh, hopefully someone can re-describe it properly and we can finally have this be Strausia bushii. A um, couple others, and then our third one up here, Strausia vitigera. So I think you can all see they are not one another's closest relatives. They're actually not all that closely related within the genus which supports this idea that they've come to coexist via host shifting probably from other host plants. I will just point out one other thing up here. We've got three flies collected by Alan uh, off of Helianthus natali natalii in Arizona. These look like they form a different clade. There's also obviously this geographic difference. Possible mm -hmm. there are different species. 
But then even cooler is we've got a bunch of flies, vitigera flies off of Helianthus strumosus up here. These are largely sympatric with these ones on tuberosus down here. And we think that this is a very strong indication that we have a new species here. And we actually have an undergraduate now studying these and seeing if she can pick out some morphological differences. Um, I'm gonna, having gotten to this point, I'm gonna now uh, throw over to Elaine uh, and she's gonna tell you about the rest of her work. So uh, go for it, Elaine. Great, thanks. Can you guys hear me okay and everything? Okay. Um, yeah, so pretty much from here, we've kind of established that we have multiple species on the same host plant. Um, so some of our more recent work has focused more on how are these guys coexisting on this shared resource, kind of like Andrew talked in the very beginning. Um, they have this overlapping niche. They all depend on using this plant for their entire life cycle. How are they able to navigate uh, that kind of ecological challenge? Uh, so some previous work in uh, the Strausia system showed that different Strausia species um, emerge at different times during the summer. Uh, so you can see in some of these cases, certain Strausia species have almost no overlap in the time that they're adults uh, throughout the summer. So one of the first things we wanted to do is just to uh, kind of think about this idea in terms of how flies may be sharing this host plant. Um, so when we think about those three flies that are all on Helianthus tuberosus, uh, we were thinking that if these flies are dividing up the space uh, in a process we call like temporal isolation or allochronic isolation, uh, they may be able to use this as a way to facilitate that sharing of that habitat. Uh, so if we imagine we have a first fly coming out early in the summer in May and June, a second one coming out in June and July, and then another one in August, um, we could imagine that as a plant grows throughout the summer, um, there may be opportunities that open up for uh, eggs to be laid and larvae to utilize different parts of that resource. As you can see, as the plant grows throughout the summer, uh, different species uh, could lay their eggs and then larvae could utilize a portion of that stem while, per while allowing for uh, other parts of the stem to be available for another species. So to look into this further, uh, we first just wanted to see if this allochronic isolation is actually happening uh, between our species on Helianthus tuberosus. Uh, so we did this in a couple different ways. First, by just collecting flies in the field. So this is just showing you a single uh, year of collections. Um, and what you can see is that Strausia vitigera comes out early in the season, uh, Longipennis comes out towards the end, and Strausia longitudinalis comes out in the middle. And these are statistically significant differences. So we start to see a little bit of this evidence of allochronic isolation. Uh, we did the same thing with um, flies emerging at different times. So in this case, we took pupae, brought them into the lab, and then recorded when they emerged throughout the summer. And in this case, we see that same pattern where uh, different species are emerging at different times, uh, kind of giving more evidence that these three species that all share Helianthus tuberosus are um, partitioning out the summer and kind of experiencing this allochronic isolation. Uh, so if we think about that in terms of the plant stem, uh, we did a couple different things. First, we've done a series of observational analyses where we gave uh, plants to female flies of all different species. And we found that all these species, the females will lay their eggs in the same spot in the relative plant stem. However, when you dissect uh, stems in the fall, uh, once the larvae have developed and started moving around inside the plant stem, we find that these larvae are actually at significantly different heights in the stem, where some are farther up, some are more in the middle, and some are farther towards the bottom. Um, these are kind of indications that the flies may be kind of partitioning this resource and allochronic isolation may be a way that's facilitating this host partitioning. However, uh, these flies also are navigating other dynamics while they're sharing the same host, uh, one of which is when they come into contact with each other, whether they will uh, mate with incorrect species or if they are um, able to discriminate and prevent hybridization. Um, so this is a chart showing you uh, the mating frequencies when you put all possible combinations of females and males that are found on Helianthus tuberosus uh, into a cup, we see if they mate. Um, in this case, we're showing you, so in this column, all the, all the females are across the top, all the males are down the side. And 
all of those values that are in red uh, and bolded are situations in which there's a significantly different um, mating frequency compared to those same lineage crosses. So in all these cases, uh, there, there's less frequent mating uh, than if they're with a conspecific or the same species, male and female. Uh, so this seems to indicate that there's some sexual isolation also happening where the flies are uh, choosing not to mate with an incorrect species. And that kind of led us to thinking about how they may be discriminating between species. As Andrew showed you earlier, and I'll just remind you again, we have the females, um, the wings look pretty similar for all these species. These are kind of, this is one of the traits that really stands out for us. Um, and so longitudinalis, patidra, and longipennis, all the female wings seem to be about the same. Uh, this wing pattern is uh, kind of particularly familiar for tephridids because they, they've been known in other tephridid species to uh, be preventing predation uh, by, by using this wing pattern as a kind of a mimic uh, to prevent predation from jumping spiders. Uh, so there's kind of a specific historical reason why these uh, female wings may be this way. Uh, however, in the males, uh, we see really different patterns emerging. So here's our longitudinalis, our longipennis, and our batidra. Um, and in this case, all these males uh, have this pretty distinct different wing pattern. And what's interesting about this is that, um, as Andrew told you in the beginning, um, the males are territorial and they'll stake out a territory on the underside of a leaf. And the females will be the ones walking around searching for mates on the plant. And so we're kind of wondering if this kind of the female behavior for searching for mates may be a way that it's driving the male trait evolution for some of these traits such as the wing pattern. Uh, so when we first got our phylogeny that Andrew was showing you at the very end of his section, uh, one of the first things we wanted to do is we just plotted all the uh, different wing patterns for females in the left column and males in the right column uh, to just kind of see how these patterns emerged on the tree. And one of the things that we pointed out or that we noticed right away is that many of the flies that have uh, sexual dimorphism are kind of, it's not the whole genus, there's just a handful of those that are sexually dimorphic. And all of those are kind of in the single clade that, have, that has uh, speciated more recently. Uh, we also were interested in how this dimorphism looked in terms of host sharing. And one of the things we found is that we tend to find uh, species that are such sexually dimorphic in situations where they're sharing hosts. So these three stars are, uh, here's our Batidra, uh, Longipennis, and Longitudinalis. And in this case, two of those three species display this sexually dimorphic pattern. We see the same thing is true for the Helianthus grossus serratus fly. So this is another situation where we have three flies that are sharing a single host plant. And that same pattern is true where two of the three species are sexually dimorphic. Uh, so this kind of has led us to wonder if there's some kind of relationship between uh, sexual dimorphism in this wing pattern variation and the ability to share host plants. There's also a couple other features that uh, we've been looking into in terms of just how the males differ um, at a couple different traits. Uh, so one of those is the wing shape. Uh, so we're using uh, morphometric uh, measures of wing shape to uh, look at the overall wing pattern variation or wing shape variation. And then also the these frontal orbital bristles uh, that we see in males that are uh, particularly uh, long and they really stand out. So we've been looking at these two characteristics as well. So I'm gonna show you a little bit about the wings here first. Um, so these are two principal component analyses. So this is pretty much summarizing all of the wing male, sh uh, wing shape variation in males. And what we find here that's interesting is that in both tuberosis and grossus serratus, so these two situations where we have multiple species sharing the same host plant, we have uh, males that look different from each other. So the, wing, the total wing shape variation that we see in these three species is not overlapping. So they're slightly different, especially in grossus serratus. Uh, we also notice that there's a possible sexual di sexually dimorphic uh, feature to this where in these situations when a host plant is shared, um, we notice that the females in this red color and the males in black are uh, have very different wing shapes 
when they're on shared hosts. However, when they're on the same host with no additional species, um, as in Strausia intermedia, we have um, we see that the wing shape is pretty much the same for both females and males. So we don't seem to see that same uh, sexual dimorphism that we saw in uh, a couple other ex examples, Lontopenis and Noctopenis, that are both uh, sharing hosts with other Strausia species. Now, this, is, this, is, this is me again. Um, so I'm going to jump jump in here again, uh, mainly because I'm going to talk about uh, maybe a, a weird idea that that spins off of some of the work that Elaine's been doing. Um, so at, when when we started looking at uh, some of this data coming out of the morphology and, and wing pattern, I got um, I grabbed the uh, handbook of the fruit flies of North America and started flipping through it and looking for other situations where you have specialists to fritids that are coexisting with congeners on the same host plants. And start and this this book is great because it has pictures of the wings of most of these species. And so what I started to do is look at look at those situations and look at what the what the wings uh, look like within those genera that uh, the species in those genera when that were coexisting on the same host plant. So what we found is just five other situations where you have specialist congener to fritids that are using the same host plant. And what I, th I think is interesting, and maybe we can discuss this, is in all five cases, we see wing variation that is <coughs> at least seems unusual within that genus. And so three things about that. <clears throat> First of all, it underscores that host sharing in the to fritids is pretty rare, at least among the, the highly specialist tephridids. There's hundreds of tephridids in North America, and these five plus the, Stroud, the two uh, in Strausia are the only ones that we've been able to find. Secondly, um, there's really obvious inter, uh, interspecific wing differences in each of these five cases and also in Strausia. So this sort of lends some credence to the, at least to the hypothesis that visual cues maybe related to wing patterns might be important in mate discrimination, especially so when there are other species around that you're closely related to, um, um, maybe it's good to look different from everyone else. There's one other thing though that we noticed, uh, only one of those of these five situations do we see sexual dimorphism in the wings like we see in Strausia. And so I wanna say one more thing about that. In Strausia and in Eutrita, in this situation in Eutrita, these dimorphic uh, situations, males are defending territories and females are looking for those males, at least based on what we've been able to find of the natural history of these, of these flies. And I don't know these fly genera all that well, so this is maybe some information we can get from some of you in this group. In the other situations where they're monomorphic within a species where there's no sexual dimorphism, both sexes are described as essentially walking around on the plants looking for one another. So they're both searching for mates. So we don't have dimorphism when both are searching. We do have dimorphism when the females are searching. The males seem to uh, have the difference in morphology. And so we think perhaps that when females are actively searching, perhaps there's selection acting only on the male differences. And then the females can maybe maintain their morphology that provides them the safety from Jumping spiders, jumping spiders, and other predators. All right, back to you, Elaine. I think we only have a couple slides left, but yeah. And this is uh, another. Just this, uh, these uh, frontal orbital bristles have just been a feature that's really striking in a lot of the males, and it tends to be one of the first things that a lot of people notice when they're seeing these flies for the first time. And it's something that only the males have in this really kind of prominent way. I think females have some reduced uh, CETA here, but these guys have really prominent bristles. And so we had an undergraduate in our lab that is now a graduate student, um, and he did a bunch of analyses looking at the length and the, uh, the number and then the different shapes of the tips of these uh, bristles and he did a bunch of analyses looking at these and uh, what's been interesting so far is that he's found a lot of the same patterns that we're observing in uh, wing pattern and wing shape 
uh, where when you look at the males, and this is just uh, the variation in bristle length, so this isn't including all the other stuff, um, and we find that there's uh, distinct uh, variation that's specific to each of these species again. So somehow in this case, we have these uh, characteristics that are also evolving to look different from each other. And Elaine has a great phylogeny with the, the what we call head spikes of all the species lined up against the phylogeny. And you can, it's not a great thing to show in a, in a talk, but it's kind of stunning to see the, the evolution that's happened across the genus. So um, we could talk about the system all night, but we won't. Uh, the last thing we'll say is that we have a big population genomic project planned for sort of the next phase of this and actually had hoped to get out last year, but for various reasons that most of you can probably understand, didn't get to do that. Um, we do have some collections planned for this year. You can see we've drawn them here on this figure. I took a picture of a map in our lab just a couple minutes ago, uh, minutes before this talk. Um, but if any of you happen to be interested in helping with collections and sending flies to us this year, that would make our lives a heck of a lot, heck of a lot easier, especially with the uncertainty about being able to travel. Um, we'd also be happy to reciprocate with anything that we can collect for you for, for in Iowa. So if you're interested, please do let one or both of us know. And with that, uh, this is what we prepared for you. Hopefully it's been fun and, and useful to you. And we'd be, we'd be really happy to take questions. Uh, I think both of us uh, would be happy to answer your questions. So thanks again for the invitation. And yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so I see a I see a, a question pop up quickly here already from uh, Matt Buffington, and he asks, "Who's working on the parasitoids in these system? Are they playing a role uh, in these patterns?" Yeah, so that's a great question, Matt. Uh, I actually have done more work in parasitoids than I have on flies, and so that's something that had occurred to me as well. But they don't seem to get hit by very much. There are some. There are some Braconids that we occasionally rear from, uh, from them, like maybe once or twice we've reared a few Braconids. And then the ones that exit the plant and pupate in the soil occasionally get hit by Diapreids in genus Coptera. And besides those, I don't know of any other uh, parasitoids. We haven't really seen very many. It just doesn't seem that they're we haven't noticed that the parasitoids are doing a whole lot in the system. I'm going to stop sharing the screen here too. So, yeah. Do we have any other questions in the chat or anybody? Out there, want to shout out a question for Andrew and Elaine? I want to just say, awesome, you guys. This is just such amazing work. I'm just so pleased to hear of all this cool, cool work that you've done. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Thanks for getting us into Strasia. I could just just second that, you know, like as somebody who works mostly with morphology, this this genus has been really a um, a conundrum, let's say. Um, you know, there's some clearly distinct species, but if you if you're only looking at pin specimens with with no biology or morpho, uh, morpho uh, molecular data, they just seem like a you know a huge mass of all these overlapping characters. So, really nice to see some resolution in this group. You guys did a great job. And it looks like we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you now. Oh, sorry, can you hear me now? That's fine, I got I got the gist of that. Uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, good, thanks, good. Uh, yeah, maybe I'm having- One, uh, one thing I'll- one thing I'll just throw in quickly is um, we're not morphological uh, taxonomists by any means, and we have a lot of flies. I did say we have an undergrad looking at one of them. If anyone is interested in revising Strausia, 
uh, let us know uh, because we're probably not going to do it. So um, yeah, any any tefritted dipterists out there who want to take a crack at it, uh, we'd be happy to share specimens. Uh, a couple of questions I see here in the in the chat. Miles asks, have you considered morphospace analyses of the wings and or head spines in relation to the phylogeny? Elaine, you want to take that one? That's more your alley. Yeah, I've been kind of working on this right now and I'm working on getting the phylogenetics data integrated with the morphology work. So that's kind of the direction I'm hoping to go with this because I think we don't quite have the power to test some of these hypotheses without integrating that phylogenetic information. So. Uh, it's a work in progress right now, and I'm hoping I can get that to fit into this as well, because there's definitely something there for sure. Um, Edward Barrows asks, how many Strausia species in the WD area? I actually don't know what WD is. I'm sorry, I, I didn't see the print too well. I was wondering about the Washington, D.C. area. I'm interested oh, yeah. in the biodiversity of this area. I, I know this fly from one of those species from Kansas, from a this tuberosis patch, but I don't tend to see them too much around here. Yeah, you you get many of the Strausia species in and around um, Washington. Uh, certainly, certainly the ones we've been talking about, um, and and several of the other species in the genus. There are a few that are a little bit further south, and there's maybe a couple that are more central Midwestern range, like Giganteus. I think is not down there, Elaine. But most of these species are where are around Washington for sure. Are they a big problem for Jerusalem artichoke growers? No, they don't. I don't think they do. They don't really damage the tubers, and that's the only thing you'd really want to you'd really want to eat on that plant. So yeah. Um, I think I think some of the one of the species was re, you know reported to uh, affect the commercial sunflowers to some extent, like it weakens the stem. So if it gets windy, they might fall over, but yep. they don't attack the, the commercial parts of the plant. That's right. Um, a question here from Matt uh, Bertone. How do the males find the host plants in order to guard territories? Um, I, if the question is how do they find the plants in the first place, we don't think that they ever go too far away from the plants. They close right underneath the plants. Um, my experience with defritids is that long-term host finding, so this is from like Ragolides, uh, long-term host finding involves both visual and olfactory cues. So picking up the odor of, of plant volatiles. My guess is that they don't need to do a whole lot of that because they're already there in, in the plants and they just fly to a leaf and, and then fly to another leaf and find the territory. Um, and then we have a question from Elizabeth Young asking who is Pronzolin Franklin? We, we occasionally have had some uh, lab crayfish as pets and we give them punny names and uh, Pronzolin Franklin was one that lived a particularly long time and we became quite fond of and decided to acknowledge her in, in this paper. So thank you for asking about her. <laughs> Uh, Ed, Liz Ed Lizowski asks, will you include this, the Colorado Strausia? Are the three Utrita gall makers on tall sage brush? So, so Ed, we do have some Strausia from Colorado someone sent us. If anyone wants to send us any more, great. I don't know anything about Utrita other than what I've been able to get out of the literature. And, um, you know, honestly, if anyone is more familiar, and Ed, maybe if you have thoughts on this, I'd love to talk about um, some of these other tefritids on that are specialists on other sharing sharing other host plants because we, we really want to go down that road a little bit more. All right, if there are no further questions, are there? Do we have anything else further? Once again, thank you, Andrew and Elaine. That's thank great. You thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have one more section of our meeting. I think actually somehow this got moved. Usually this is in the beginning section, but the um, 
presentation of notes and exhibition of specimens. This is sort of like our entomological show and tell section. Anybody's allowed to, if you've got something of interest to, to show the group, explain, um, feel free. Yeah, I, I have something I have to screen share though. Okay. Okay, you're gonna let me do it. All right. Let me hope I can get there. Uh, I guess I have to, I'm not seeing it. I had it set up before. Maybe I can find it here. Yeah, uh, we're gonna have a cicada talk next time. And some of us are very excited about the cicadas. I just wanted to show you a plate from my book that's out right now. It's not, it's, it's on ecology of the general area, not just cicadas. But here's some pictures. I need my magnifying glass to look at this because it's so tiny on my laptop. But this is um, Linnaeus periodic cicadas, one of the 17 year cicadas. And I, I last time they came out, 2004. I don't know, I got pretty excited and stayed up all night and took pictures of their emerging from their exubii and so forth. So I just wanted to point out that here's a sequence and here you see a big droplet of blood that came out of the leg of one of them. This is all the same individual actually, except for down here. And I don't think we uh, see your screen unless I both sees it. Oh, you don't? I don't. Hmm. Uh, well, I guess, how do I go back? I guess I go back this way. And I try screen sharing again. Can you see it now? No. Oh, here it comes. There we go. Oh, okay. Yeah, it works pretty well in class, but it's, I guess, a little confusing here. So this is the droplet of blood I was talking about. And the, the insects seem to develop fine, despite bleeding a little bit. And one thing I noticed, I've been looking at a lot of pictures online and other ones I took. And when their wings come out, they come out asymmetrically at first. And they're either, either right-handed or left-handed when they do this. This is the same individual and you can see it's a male. His wings came out pretty well. And then what I'm trying to show here is the really common red-eyed variety and the very rare whitish-eyed variety. Some people call them blue eyes. So there may be one in a million or so. I was able to stumble over one back uh, in 2004. And then I have one other plate and I've got to, they're separate. So I have to leave this, see if I can pick up the other plate. Yeah, there it is. This is uh, neo Tibisin, however you say it. And I just luckily saw this larva or nymph on one of my potting tables and to me, it looked like it was going to emerge. So I stuck it on a stick and sure enough, it came out and it came out, see the asymmetrical wing extension. I'm not sure that anybody studied that. Maybe somebody has, but this is the sequence. So if you stay up at night during our big brood 10 emergence, you can see a lot of this kind of development. That's it, thank you. So I guess- Well, I thank you, man. I have to close this down and stop screen sharing somehow. I'm not sure how to get, oh, here it is. There we go. Thank you. Do we have any other items to share? Any other questions, comments? Once again, I'd like to thank Andrew and Elaine. Great presentation. It's a joy having everybody here tonight. Good to see you. And remember next month, first Thursday, uh, will be a talk on cicadas. So that was a good lead into our, to our next talk for next month. Do we have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion. Um, and how about a second? Do I hear a second? Second. Second. Hear a second. The meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Have a great night. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Bye.